We are studying through the book of Titus, if you'll turn to that. Titus is really a vacuum-packed book. I thought these three little chapters, and you start to open them up, and they just keep growing and getting bigger, and I feel like we should study it again. I'm just starting to understand the book. So it's just been beautiful studying the book of Titus, and this morning we come to the close of our study in this letter. We're going to be finishing up uh, in chapter 3. So it's been a good season in the Word of God, and I know some of you always say, Pastor, have you ever had a bad season in the Word of God? No. I haven't, but this has been special. This has really been a special season, and Paul is instructing Titus how to help these little fledgling churches on the island of Crete, and they're being attacked from within. There's false teachers in the churches, and there's divisive people causing problems in these bodies. Then they're being attacked from without. It's a pagan society that they live in with a very difficult government, godless people who are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, as one of their own poets said. And so the call of Titus is to insulate these churches from evil, yet to reach the evil of their society with the gospel. So we insulate from the evil, and now we need to reach it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how do we insulate the churches from evil? First, we have chapter 1, we have elders who are to teach sound doctrine. They're to refute false teachers and keep in season and out of season teaching the word of God. Then the church, in chapter 2, we we disciple one another. Older men are teaching younger men how to be godly younger men, and older women are teaching younger women how to be godly. We, We pour into each other's lives, teaching each other how to live above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And then in chapter 3, we saw the future of the church is is being deliberate about pouring into one another and helping each other mature and keep journeying through every high and stormy gale. And so you're doing a beautiful job of pouring in to one another. So how do we reach the pagan society that we live in? And that's what we've been looking at in chapter 3. And in verse 1, Paul says, Titus, remind them. Remember these things. And last week, remember their calling as they go into this world to be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient and ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. We go into this world with the mind and the heart of Christ. Then remind them of their condition. Remember that you too were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Never get over where you have come from. You were dead in your sins. Don't get past it. Don't become these judgmental, critical people. Don't forget where you have come from. And then remind them of their conversion. When the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appear, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Never get over that God saved us. It's a sovereign action. It is God who did it. Never should we ever be haughty, but the humble people that I was in that condition, I could not fix it, and God reached down and he saved me. Never get over it. And then remind them of their commission in verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. And our commission then is to enter into this world and do men good deeds. We, are, we receive the goodness of God, and we are manifestors now of the goodness of God. We received his kindness. We go show kindness now to this world. Don't miss this, because he's, Paul says this is what will adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Your personal holiness matters to the cause of the gospel. It is a big deal that we seek personal holiness and corporate holiness to put on display a saving God. This morning, this morning now, Paul will close out this letter, and he'll address a couple of different relationships within the church and how we're to deal with them. These are very important, I think, to the time that we live in because we live in the day of political correctness, and it has creeped its way into the church, and we just think that we're to smile and accept anything that people say in the church in the name of love. 
And Paul is going to show us how we are to function with certain people in our congregations in love. And did you know that rejecting someone is actually more loving than to receive what they're saying if it's divisive and heresy? And so he's going to now teach us how do, how do we deal with these things. Uh, sorry to not be politically correct, but my goal is to be biblically correct. And so we are going to look this morning and just say, how do we treat this in the body of Christ? So let's take a look at Paul's closing thoughts, if you would. Look with me in verse 9. He's going to talk first about false teachers again. Verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Chapter 1, we saw that false teachers were alive and well on this island of Crete. The devil is a liar. He's a liar and he spreads lies as his device against the church of God. So the way he hurts the church, he brings deceit and lies and he sows them into the body. And the way to fight it in chapter 1 is with truth. We fight it with truth and pure doctrine and lives that are being changed by that truth. So Paul said the false teachers, their lives are worthless and detestable for any good thing in Titus 1.16. But you, Titus, in chapter 2, verse 1, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. And then in 2.15, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. The battle is for truth, and it is raging and waging war in Crete. And it's raging in America, and it's raging in South Denver. There is a battle for truth. And so the battle for the church will always be true teachers establishing the church in sound doctrine, teaching the whole counsel of God and the Word of God and commitment to it. And then false teachers must be silenced from being sown air into the body of Christ. This morning, it's not enough then just for the elders and the teachers to refute them. It's not enough just for that. The congregation has a responsibility to them as well. And so we have a responsibility corporately to false teachers and troublemakers. It's a team effort. It's a family. It's all of us working together for the purity of truth. So what do we do with false teachers? Look at me in verse 9. We avoid them. We avoid them. That means to treat someone with indifference or contempt. Avoid them. Turn your back on them and walk away. This is our responsibility to false teachers, not to feel bad and just hear them out. I want to be cordial. I want to be polite while they're sowing falsities all through the body. This does not just mean when you disagree with someone. So now some of you, I know it. You're just sitting there going, oh, good. Now I can walk away and treat people with contempt. That's not what pastor's saying. He's saying you can do that with false teachers, people who are spreading strife in the body. So what, what then am I, am I to shun? What am I to avoid in verse 9? Well, we're to avoid foolish controversies. The Greek word for foolish, I love that word, moranos. You know where we're going. Moronic. Avoid just moronic controversies. And sometimes I, just, I can hear them and I'm like, that's moronic. Why are you spending all your time on moronic controversies? All the time. All it is is about these things that are moronic. It attacks the truth and the purity of the doctrine that's being discussed and built in and sown into our lives. It's to distract people from Titus 2, 11 through 14 on the gospel that we've been studying in last week as well in Titus 3. To get our minds on non-essentials that don't matter. It's the essentials. The the non-essentials to them are the essentials and that's all they want to focus on. The atonement of Jesus Christ, instead of that, they want to talk about uh, the Nephilim and that they're on the same par, exactly what they were. Justification by faith in Christ alone is the same as whether God can make a rock bigger than he can lift. 1 Timothy 6.4, Paul said this, This person is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. They're just lost in those things. And so this might sound harsh, but Paul says, shun it. Quit listening to it. Don't even give it an ear to express the moranos of it all. Walk away. Shun it. I just wonder how many have been lost to real kingdom work for the good of all men with the gospel being adorned to this nonsense. 
instead of really giving ourselves to what we've learned in Titus, you spend all of your days on these disputes and discussions because it keeps you from having to engage in lives and love people and suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And instead of doing that, I'd rather talk about Moreno's things in the corner showing how smart I am. That's what Paul's after. Lies, academia, controversies all the time, and you never do men good. You think God is really pleased with what they're doing while they disrupt the unity of the Spirit on a daily basis. I want you to listen to what Paul said when he wrote Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 2. Listen to this. <coughs> Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless, and it leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. Give yourself to that word of God, handling it accurately and teaching it. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them, I'm going to call them out, Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they're upsetting the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if a man cleanses himself from these things, he'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Give yourself to those things, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. But be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, and with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his will. That's Titus in a nutshell. Don't give yourself to this stuff. Give yourself to the truth and the doctrine and growing in it so that you might enter into lives and do men good instead of being one of those who just want to talk about all these foolish controversies and never do anything. Paul's rebuking that this morning. He says in verse 9, I also want you to avoid genealogies. Uh, This doesn't mean in Matthew 1 and all throughout the Bible you don't read genealogies, but um, those are rich in redemptive history. They're beautiful, the genealogies. But in that day, there was this wild allegorical interpretation of lists and names, and they would make up legends and myths and all kinds of fables with these genealogies. And he says, avoid those who do fanciful things with the Word of God through these genealogies. We have several cults in our day that have even done that same thing with genealogies. So avoid that. Thirdly, avoid strife and disputes about the law. The word strife means rivalry, contention, disputes, or evil suspicion. Avoid that constant friction that Timothy talks about. It it does not unify like true doctrine should, but it disunifies when you use the law in this way that Paul is describing. Listen to what Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. He says, the goal of our instruction then is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the goal of our teaching. For some men, Straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion. Here it is. Wanting to be teachers of the law. I'm a teacher. And though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. They find these little nuances about law and drive them and get lost in them. And they don't even know how to use the law as if it's still binding in every sense that it was upon Israel. And they get lost in all of this stuff. The church should get lost in the doctrine. I just want to read the doctrines that we studied last week. We looked at kindness, the incarnation, love for mankind, salvation, not merit being saved by mercy, regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, justification, grace, inheritance, and the second coming. 
That would keep us busy for a lifetime to plummet all of those gorgeous, beautiful truths. Give yourselves to these things. Give yourselves to them. The unifying truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the disunifying, disputing over foolish controversies and genealogies and mindless details about the law. Stop. Avoid them. Shun it. This is essential to the churches on Crete, and it's essential for Southside Bible Church today that we don't get lost in this kind of stuff. I've been fighting this since the day we started, and, and I will continue to fight it when you want to get off and do those things and disunify the church and never grow up anybody or help them. We, we will fight that to the end. We, 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 don't, uh, we major on the majors and we minor on the minors. And so I just want to ask you as we sit here before God, is, is this you? Am I describing you? Do you have this kind of a disposition this morning? Are you a unifier of the brethren? Or are you fighting over all these nonsensical nuances that will not grow anyone up into the image of Christ? All it is is about your pride and what you know. Is it the goodness that I want to build and love and do Titus to in the body of Christ? What, what are you going to give your life to? Are you going to be the guy that's got all the nuances and just sit there and spew them your whole life? Or are you going to be the one that's pouring into people, seeing lives changed? These doctrines sown and poured into every life you come in contact with. Or you spend your days to show how smart you are and the detailed explanation of the law and all the little nuances that will just exalt self. When they really just show how much of a Pharisee we are. They were experts in this making laws of what constituted work on a Sabbath to every little minutia detail. That's what was going on, the same thing. Measuring out spices from the garden to tithe appropriately why they won't help their parents in need. Crucifying Jesus, not entering the praetorium to defile themselves so they can still eat the Passover as they're killing the Son of God. It's, it's easy to do. And so I just want to ask you, are you lost in the wrong things? Or are you about the right things that Paul is instructing to Titus? This is the only way the body will cause the growth of the body. And so I pray, if, if this is your portrait this morning, that you would repent of this kind of behavior. And then Paul's going to take it one step forward. This is someone who's not just prideful and getting lost in academic arguments and trying to show off your knowledge. But this is someone now who goes a step forward, or should I say a, a step downward. Uh, to, so to speak. Now he's going to say in verse 10 through 11, avoid someone who's factious. Look with me in verse 10. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. <coughs> I've had many dealings with these kinds as someone who now they are out to divide the church. They actually fracture the fellowship. They're out to break the unity of the church. And so, uh, remember, this whole book, Sound Doctrine with Love Expressed as our platform to evangelize the world. And it's done by showing forth our unity and our likeness to Jesus Christ. That's where the enemy is going to attack. It has always been the problem for the church. We see it throughout the New Testament. In Corinth, Paul is trying to bring unity to a very disunified church. I'm teaching through Philippians right now, and there is an issue of disunity that Paul is fixing in that church. Ephesians 4, we had three chapters of doctrine, now live in a life worthy, a worthy manner of the gospel. And where do you start, Paul? What does that look like? Well, it starts with uh, keeping the unity of the faith, fighting to keep the unity in the body. He spends more time in Ephesians, 16 verses on how we live together in the body as living worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there will always be those who want to disrupt the unity of the Spirit and to bring discord and to be divisive. And Paul says, reject a factious man. The Greek word for factious is heretikos. Where we get what word? Heretic. Reject a heretikos in your midst. It means to cause division. It's not just false teaching. Really, the word heretic, that word developed later where it became what we hear today when we think of heretic, a false teacher, a going away from the truths of the doctrine. So it, earlier use was just someone who was a troublemaker, someone who was factious, argumentative or contentious about what the church is teaching. And so it takes what we just saw 
and, and you shun them and you walk away from them and now you get more into motive and heart. They just want to cause division, whether perceived or not. That's what they're after and that's what's happening. And most often what these guys or girls, they feel very virtuous. They're, they think that they, they're just helping the church. And I, I had an Absalom. After every time I would preach, he would just slither around and sl- sow discord to everyone about the truth and what I preached on. And all he did was just cause divisiveness every Sunday. It's to choose a course of behavior against the truth or against the leadership of a church. They will not be part of the unity of the church. And so this is someone who seeks a gathering or a following by strife and factions in the church. These are people who are divisive. Really, you won't enter into the unity of the Spirit. You're, you're the, both these people that have been just described, they're always on the outside fighting and hurting the church rather than those who grab hold of this gospel. We grab hearts, we, we get together, we unify, and we advance the kingdom of God. These are those who are destroying that and fighting against it. So maybe ask yourself, are you the one grabbing hands, getting in, advancing the name of Jesus Christ, using every gift that you have, sacrificing time? What can I do to be a part of the advancement of the gospel? That, that's the beauty and the purity of what we're seeing in Titus. So what do we do with these kind of people in the church? It's, it's more serious than the last group, and it poses a danger Paul says to reject them. That word means to have nothing to do with them. Re- reject them. Matthew 18, 17, when you go through church discipline, that last step, if they won't listen to the whole church, you cut them off and you remove them. You shame them by putting them out of the fellowship that they might repent from their sin and turn to God. And I don't believe that this is Matthew 18 here in Titus. Some people think that it's Paul saying the same thing. I don't believe that. There's only two warnings and you reject them. And most likely, the last step in Matthew 18 is you send them to the whole church. So when you have someone extremely divisive, do you want to send the whole church to them? Here, why, don't, why doesn't everybody go after heretic Jimmy and go and let him sow all of his strife to you? Of course not. And so this isn't Matthew 18. Is we, we warn them to stop. And if they won't stop, we warn them again. And if they won't stop, we have nothing to do with them. The goal is we want them to repent. I want anyone in the first category this morning to repent and I want anybody in the second category to repent we try so hard to lead you to repentance so that you will adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ and not harm it that you might be useful for the kingdom of God that's my heart and that's my desire I don't want you to waste your days and stand before God having done this I don't want you to come to judgment day and think you did something to show the Lord and here's all of my fruit and you figured out Uh, all these little nuances, and and you had all these amazing truths figured out that you brought to others to bless them supposedly, and all you did was hurt the unity of the Spirit of the body of Christ for which Jesus Christ gave his blood for his bride. And you're going to stand there, and all you did was hurt it. All of your days, thinking you were some hero to the church. I pray that you wouldn't be there, that you are the one always right. You just keep breaking up homes, offices, and churches and, and, and if that's you this morning, you've got to repent. And, we're, and you give them two tries. And if there's no repentance, you reject them. And in verse 11, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. The whole design and structure and purpose of the church that we've learned in Titus cannot have people like this in it. It's loving to remove someone like this from our midst if they won't repent after two warnings. They're perverted, Paul says. That means turned inside out, distorted, dislocated. They're dislocated. They're not, they're not stable. They're not right. They're sinning. They're continuing in a course that is contrary to the will of God. And Paul says they're self-condemned. They're passing judgment upon themselves by the way that they're acting. Have nothing to do with them. And too many times in the church, these people are tolerated in the name of love. And many times they're giving platforms to teach. And so this is how... Uh, this is how Paul wants us to deal with these two types. And I just, I hate to end Titus as Debbie Downer, okay? That, that isn't the most exciting thing I've ever preached, but it's necessary for the kingdom of God to function the right way. But I just want to close out with the last group of people that Paul is going to mention, and this is our friends. So we've got the foolish, the factious, and now we get a look at our friends uh, in verses 12 through 15. When I said Artemis, 
or Tychicus to you when I sent them. Make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds and to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. <clears throat> so these are those who, again, what I've been preaching right this morning, they're, they're one with us. They're those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. They just want to grow in Him. They want to adorn His saving name to the world. We're, we're one in this. And so we have those in the church as well. We have them by the droves. And I'm so blessed by the hearts here. I, I, as I was studying this, I can't even put a face to any of those this morning. Praise the Lord. The, of the heretic, of the, the divisive person, and someone just always doing the other. I, I rejoice in that. I, what I'm seeing is a real unification by the Spirit of God in this body. Uh, very, very few, like I described. No one divisive that I know of at this time. And so some are learning not to cause divisions by all of their new revelations in Scripture. So I, I applaud you. Some of you came that way, and you're growing, and you're starting to quit doing that. Uh, you're learning how to disagree in a way that glorifies God, how to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And that's our goal here, is that because we're unified on the essentials that save and transform lives. And so we hold our differences in a way that keeps unity and builds up the body in, in these truths. And so when we look at these kind of folk then on the island of Crete, look in verse 12, he talks about the fellow servants. These were those who were working under Paul. Paul was like the general of the church. And so Titus is to attend to these servants that he's going to send. Paul's going to send Artemis and Tychicus to this church to help Titus. And so I don't, we couldn't find anything about Artemis, just trying to research him. There, we, I couldn't get any details on him, but I like the name. Tychicus, in Acts 20, he was the one who delivered the Ephesian and the Colossian letters by Paul to those churches. Uh, they talk about him in Ephesians 6.21. But that you also may know about my circumstances, Paul writes, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. So that faithful brother, when he comes, he'll let you know more of the details. And so he was sent to Ephesus to replace Timothy and so here are some really good men, Paul's saying, uh, Titus, that I'm going to send to you and they're going to minister to you and they are going to help you. And then in verse 13, he says, diligently help Zenos, the lawyer. And I just think that's in there to prove that, that, that you can have someone be a Christian and a lawyer. <laughs> so I appreciate Paul dropping that in there. Apollos was the man mighty in the scriptures. He worked at Corinth. And he was a partner with Paul. And he says they'll meet their needs in the unity. And so just see this, guys. They're a team. They're, they're a team. We're, we're unified. We don't have, a, you know, there, there's so many churches here in Denver trying to meet with different pastors and unifying. Is, or just, I want you to get the vision. Is The church of God is we're one and we're a team for the name that is above every name and to lift it high. We're united. And Paul says then, diligently Help those men when I send them. That word means eagerly or passionately. With all of your being, help these men as they come to the church. Assist each other for the help of the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So shun and reject the factious and the, the, all the know-it-all. But now help each other, the, 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 the true ones. Help each other with what? Well, here's what we've got to help each other with in verse 14. Our people must learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Give yourselves to meeting pressing needs, caring, helping. I, I love uh, the way he words that, in good deeds. Engage in good deeds. I love it there for the memorial service tonight. Laura just flipped it on the on the website of the needs and within 24 hours everything was filled and every everything we've ever done here from just fellowships just anything that gets put up there you guys fill it within 24 hours and you know what i call that zealous to engage in good deeds and i just i just keep seeing it every time there's a need anything that comes up it's just you're, you're zealous to jump in and love and serve and that's what he says get in love each other meet needs they're, they're just everywhere by our love, all men will know that we are Christians. 
Is this you? Are you the guy who knows a lot and judges everyone around you? You focus on everything but the kindness of God that has taken away your heart and now you are kind in the most supernatural way. You went from selfish to selfless. Is that you? Do do you just have a bunch of things in your head and you're the meanest person around? No one wants to get near you. Or would someone describe you as they're kind? There's a kindness to them because the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Are you devoted to divisiveness where you use others for yourself? Or are you devoted to doing good where you use yourself for others? Which are you? Which, which category would you fall into this morning? And that is how you know if the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to you. There is no way to weasel out by your great knowledge and your love of doctrine that you cannot weasel out from under what this must produce in your life. Has the truth produced this in your life this morning? This is what Palin Genesis, the new birth that we looked at last week, does in a heart. This is how you know if you've been born again. I spent many decades watching people who love the truth supposedly, and it, it never bore any fruit in loving other people. They're just mean and gnarly, gnarly dudes. You've just gone from church to church being divisive, never even getting close to what Paul is talking about here. And so maybe to this morning could be your day of repentance where you would, you would own and just finally look before God and say, all I've become is a crusty old man. This, I'm just mean. And it's never produced the fruit of the Spirit. And, and this morning, Jesus, he's a Savior from, from sin. And I want you to look and believe upon him and let the kindness of God permeate you till kindness comes out of you. Look to Christ if that's who you are this morning. Ask those who are close to you, what kind of a person am I? Am I one where we join hands and love and help and labor together for that name that is above every name? Or am I the other that we're supposed to shun and reject? God must hate this in his church. If he would have us treat someone with that much strength and swiftness, to have nothing to do with them, how, how much do you think God must hate that then in the bride of Christ? Let that get in if you struggle with this. Do you hate it in your own heart? I got this stuff dwelling in seed form in my own heart. And, and I can be a know-it-all. And if this grows up in me, I'm going to ask you to reject me and have nothing to do with me. It scares me, and I pray that all of us would say, God hates this. Don't, don't let this grow up in my heart. Let's protect each other and help each other in this. The beauty of Titus. May it end with us engaging in good deeds by pouring into one another and discipling each other and by going out into this world and doing all men good. May, may that be the fruit of the doctrine that's being taught again and again at Southside Bible. Will it instruct us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and meet pressing needs? Go meet the pressing needs. They're abundant and they're all around us. I don't even have to look. They're just everywhere. If you can go a week and say, where are the needs? Something's wrong. May fruit abound in the assembly of Southside Bible Church so that all men will marvel at the beauty of a saving God. And if they do, our evangelism will explode. And in verse 15, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And so the, the, the most beautiful thing that we looked at on Friday night in the college group is the, the grace of God. It's, it's an attribute. It's the very essence of who he is and that he dispenses grace upon people. And, and it's an empowerment to be conformed and changed into the image of Jesus Christ. It, it began in eternity past when he set his love on us, and it ends in eternity future when he glorifies us forever. It's the, it's the grace of God is what we all live, bathe, and need. And so he laid out this beautiful letter. And I, I, I just pray for you. Grace be with you. When the grace of God come upon every life to where we will manifest and live and be these kind of people for the name that's above every name. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray grace to this congregation. I pray that your grace would abound more and more. 
Lord, I pray that um, it would cause us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, but that we would live righteously and sensibly and just in this present day. God, I thank you for what we've seen in the book of Titus. I thank you for the beauties and the glories of what have been revealed to us in this book. For we have seen the excellencies of Christ, and we have seen the fruit that it produces in a church. And so, God, I pray that we would be a group devoted to truth, that we would study long and hard, dependent upon you, to proclaim deeper and deeper the beauties that are within this inspired word of God. I pray that we would never look to foolish schemes or our own hands or devices that are cleverly devised in our day and age. God, the word of God, that it would be our sufficiency and that we would we'd hold it to be the very word of God and that we would teach it and preach it. And I pray that the people would treat it as the word of God and they would study it and read it and learn it and sow it into each other's lives. God, for these are the words of you. Lord, let us treasure that and hold it right. And I pray that it would produce lives that would pour into one another. God, that the the older women would give themselves to the younger and they would teach them and model and help them understand how to live as godly women in a dark world. And I pray for the older men, rise up older men, God, that they would pour into the younger men and teach them how to be sensible and sober and righteous in this day and age. And I pray that we would adorn the gospel by the way we would live our lives then. Lord, that people could not criticize the gospel by our lives, but that they would bend their knee to it because of our lives. God, I pray that you would work mighty things in the discipleship of this church. And I pray that we would be a testimony in this community. I pray that we wouldn't be those fighting against government and authorities and rulers, but we would be peaceable doing all men good. God, that we would find a million ways, the way that you have loved us, that it would be expressed in the life of every life that you bring near us. God, may we be Christ to this world. May we have the heart and the the care and the love that he walked this world with. God, I pray that his kindness would just permeate our hearts into every life that we come in contact. And I pray by this you would draw many men, women, and children to yourself to behold the Lord Jesus Christ. God, as we hear these beautiful things, we bow our knee and we ask for grace. We need your grace for any of these things to ever happen. And I pray by your grace, you would therefore get all the glory for this little colony of heaven here on earth called Southside Bible Church. God, I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.